Welcome back, everyone, to another Voices with Raveki. I'm very excited. Uh, this is uh, my second time to talk at length and in depth with Rich Blundell. There was such a fantastic uh, response to our last uh, Dialogos, because I believe we actually got into that, um, that uh, I, I, want, I wanted Rick to come back. And uh, thankfully, he wanted to come back. And um, so we're going to pick up the conversation. <clears throat> and um, I think what's important to uh, remember is that Rick, Rich and I are both coming into this, right, very open-ended, uh, very exploratory, and we're welcoming you, welcoming you uh, to come along on that journey. And um, I think that's very exciting. So Rich, welcome uh, back. It's really great to have you here again. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot. appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I thought um, maybe we could start because ever since our talk last time, I've been giving a lot of thought to like, why, why are we talking? I, I feel a little bit like an anomaly because I, I follow your other conversations you know, across the whole spectrum. You, everybody from, you know, Jordan Hall, Jonathan Pedro, been doing a lot of like catching up on it. But then you get into these amazing conversations with your colleagues in cognitive science. Yes. And I find those incredibly exciting for some reason. I think I know why. I think mm -hmm. I know like why I find them so exciting um, for on multiple levels. But I thought, you know, maybe we could just spend a little bit of time trying to figure out like why, because I don't really fall into the category of a, of a colleague to you. Like I'm not doing any research. I'm not, yes. um, I'm not doing science. I'm certainly not doing science. Um, and so I just was hoping maybe we could maybe explore that a little bit. Like why, why, is, why have, we, there's a lot of reasons for me to want to talk to you. I am curious why you're willing to talk to me and I don't okay. want to put you on the spot to explain that, but that's 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 what I thought maybe we could start with that because that's something I'd like to know. Well, I mean, there's lots of reasons um, that I want to talk to you. I mean, first of all, um, I do try to talk to people. Uh, I don't have the quite the right noun for it, but that uh, like the problem with the word practice and practical is it has taken on such a market meaning and it means cutting to the bottom line and profitable and instrumentally useful. Um, I, I, I want something that's almost like the ancient Greek word ascesis, uh, which is like spiritual practice, transformation. And so I, I also want to talk to people who are addressing the meaning crisis in a way that is powerful, that is both intellectually respectable and existentially um, powerful that it I mean this for me this is the great this is the great thing of Socrates Socrates rejects the natural philosophers of his time because they're pursuing truth without transformative relevance he rejects the sophists because they're pursuing the power of transformation disconnected from a concern for what's real and for what's true and he wanted to find a way of practicing those together and that's the Socratic ideal and so the Socratic ideal that I aspire to is not a purely theoretical or a purely rhetorical endeavor. It's about something that transcends both of those. And so I like to talk to people who will talk to me in good faith and in depth, and you have, um, about how they are envisioning things and how that envisioning is allowing them to enact a way of life mm. that could make a difference. So for me, I, I mean, and I, 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 I'm asking you to take this seriously. Uh, I, I, I wanna talk to people that are embodying that Socratic ideal. I'm not saying you're Socrates, I'm not trying to put you into that place, but right, that you're living, and I mean this again, in the Socratic sense, you're living a provocative way of life. You're trying to live in a way that will provoke other people to live in convergent manner in a way that will try and well, it, not to put it too grandly, but save the planet, both save the meaning of it and save the actual materiality of it. And that seems to me to be worthy of both deep recognition and deep dialogue. So that's from my end why I'm talking to you. Okay. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's very much the same reason I want to talk to you. Mm. Um, you know, I, um, perhaps it's appropriate here to dive a little bit into, you know, my research a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess I'm, I'm not really a researcher, but in order to fulfill the requirements of the PhD, I had to do some right. research. And the research that I chose was to understand my experience of the world. And I know that's sort of, that's not quite legit in academia to pursue a research question that is, that is, you know, fundamentally relevant to one's own lived experience. For some reason, I think that might be thrown upon. It sort of crosses the objectivity line in some yes. ways, yes. but that yes. is, that is what I did. In fact, that's the, whole, that's the driving motivation behind my entire academic career, mm. which is um, to say, you know, to put it, to put it mildly, it's, it's, it's unconventional. You know, um, yeah. I had this experience with a, um, with a 800 pound bluefin tuna that sort of awakened something within me after I killed it. And I want, I, and the, the premise is that I wanted to understand what that transformation was about, like how this something mm -hmm. was communicated. And, um, that sparked in me a desire to know, to want to know how something like that could happen and what it could mean. Anyway, it turned out uncovering a lot of um, deeper things that were, you know, part of my growing up, part of my formative years uh -huh. that, uh -huh. that I was sort of revisiting in some way. Um, but so anyway, the, the, the way that that all sort of culminated was in research in understanding how engaging with the story of the universe, the mm -hmm. scientific narrative that um, the scientific narrative that's been revealed through science of how the universe has evolved from the big bang till the present day. So that's, which I guess is, you know, where you end up. If you, if you want to understand it all, you sort of have to understand it all. And that's what that was about. And so, my research was about um, coming up with a way to empirically test or empirically explore literally how engaging with the story of the universe, the story of nature as a whole, mm. could be transformative to people. Like what were the elements of that transformation? Right, right, could, right, could, right. Could, they, could they be qualified and quantified in some way? And again, this was really so that I could understand it. So sure. that I can understand, so that I can understand like, what the lived experience of that was. And so, you know, without getting into the details, you know, I, I basically took a reductionist approach, qualitative reductionist approach and identify. So I taught this course in cosmic evolution, where I told the whole story from the big bang all the way through to today. And um, then surveyed the students who were in this course over the course of my whole, you know, this was a three year study. Right. Um, and got them to answer, you know, in, in plain language. First I, had to quant first, I had to quantify whether or not a transformative experience happened. And that's something that you can get a handle on by um, asking people basically three questions. The three questions that I used as criteria for transformative experience were motivated use, which means, did you learn something in this course that you then called upon in a mm. an, context outside of the course right, where right. you're not expected. So it's not like a test where you're being expected to recall it, but you recalled it when you were just yeah. living your life. Right. That right. is an indication of transformation because it's something that came to you from yeah. the course, you integrated it into your life. In other words, it transformed you. And then the, the two others were um, expansion of perception, whether or not this course expanded your perception, which is a pretty you know, if it's a cosmic, if it's a course in cosmic evolution, it stands a good chance of expanding your perception. Right. Um, so that was the third, third, second question. The third one was about, did it have experiential value to you? So these are, these, you know, these are subjective yeah. questions, but if you answered two, two out of three of those in the affirmative, I, I sort of assumed that you, this was a transformative experience for right. you. Right. 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 Then of that subset, I then asked deeper questions to draw out, well, what was the nature of that experience? of that transformative experience. Right. And then just put, you know, I really just took the language apart, analyzed it, interpreted it, reinterpreted it, you know, went through the, the, um, you know, the, the, the process of um, validating external validity, yeah. internal, did all that. 
and basically came up with a series of qualities of transformative experience that are inherent in engaging with the story of nature. Sure. Those turned out to be largely things like understanding uh, causal relationships, how one thing leads to another, sure. things like um, narrative awareness, like yeah. what w- when you engage with the story of the universe and it's new, it tends to disrupt or perturb or, uh, or, or ask, invite you to adapt your narratives about the way the world is. Right. So narrative, you know, narrative surfaced as this really important aspect of transformation. Other things like expressions of gratitude showed up, like these right. really like, which yeah. were surprising in some way, but not surprising, you know, that yeah. Yeah. when you, when you see the big picture of how, who we are and how we came to be the way we are in the context of the cosmos, it has a tendency to elicit feelings of gratitude and appreciation. So things like that um, and others, there was another one that, that I thought was really interesting that there's this process of insignificance. People will feel yeah. ins- insignificant. Oh, yeah. 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 And then, but then often that insignificance feeling would over time, if, if the, if the student would really engage with the content would actually flip into a feeling of significance. Yes. So if you stuck with it long enough, yeah. you went from this feeling of insignificance to like, well, wait a minute, you know, we actually represent this story right here, right now, which is a pretty significant position to, to, yeah. to inhabit. So that's the nature of, you know, as far as my research goes, that's really what I sought to understand. And then what I tried to do was to take all of that and then re- reverse engineer a curriculum that would then, you know, take all of these ideas and these conceptual changes and actually convert them into experiences that one can have in right. the world. Right. So right. the idea was to go from these conceptual understandings of of, of these elements and, and, and build experiences that if you can recreate those experiences in a, you know, more informal learning setting, then you could actually get the transformative experience um, more widely distributed. Now, why the question, and this is where I think one of the, one of the ways or one of the areas where what I'm doing and what you're doing sort of find each other that, um, what is the, what is the point of that transformative experience? Like what, what is the nature of it and what, is, what value or what function could it serve in the way we sort of live our lives mm-hmm. Indivi- individually, personally, and then also collectively, yes. like how would the collective expression of living a life that's cognizant and aware and feels a sense of participation in this yeah. cosmos, in the natural yeah. world. Yes how would that intersect with the the the, the meaning crisis basically yeah, yep. i i use the term the anthropocene as my sort of catch-all sure. because i'm in, in the environmental sciences and the anthropocene you know you can it's it's this it's this idea that um the humans have this impact on the planet like you know this just global scale impact and i looked at the science of all that and the way that it's divided up how what scientists do is to divide all of these domains into, um, you know, into disciplines, basically. Yes. How, how is, how is the, how is humanity affecting the planet? Well, we are pumping, you know, nutrients, phosphates, nitrates into the environment, and that's having a consequence. We are pumping CO2 into the atmosphere and that's having a consequence. We're using land and soils in a way that's unsustainable and that's having a consequences. We are, um, you know, there's all kinds of socioeconomic aspects of the Anthropocene. But what I realized when I looked at it is that nowhere in the model of the Anthropocene, you know, as far as the scientists are concerned, is the actual Anthropos part. Yes. Like, yes. Yes. What they, they're not, they, they, science doesn't study the Anthropos in that way. You know, maybe it starts to in the social sciences and things like that, but there's there's no real acknowledgement of the deep fundamental ways of living and the beliefs behind those ways of living that contribute to the anthropocene so yes. so we're so what we end up with is this system where we treat symptoms the symptoms of that deeper thinking as and not the deeper thinking that causes those symptoms yeah yeah it's, i'm in 
found agreement with them. Yeah. So there's this sort of whack-a-mole um, approach that we yep. see all these symptoms like pollution and, you know, economic injustice and xenophobia. All, and these are just symptoms of, the, of, of some deeper, uh, some deeper pathology that, that we're not really equipped or prepared or ready to, to explore until it gets to the point where it's existential, which is where we are now. So now it's like, well, we need to get serious about asking, well, how did we get here? How, what are the habits of thinking and the habits of organizing ourselves that brought us to this point? And so this is where I think that it intersects with the meaning crisis. Um, so yeah, um, does that give you any fodder to? Very much so. I mean, I think, um, I think the well, there's so much what you said, uh, but first of all, uh, no, no, don't apologize. Don't ever apologize for giving <laughs> a lot of thought. That should never be something we should apologize for. Um, so that idea, I'll, I'll start here. I was looking for where to start to try and thread, right? The idea that a lot of this is symptomatic and, there, and we're not looking at the deeper cause, I, I profoundly agree with that. And uh, I've been trying to... Uh, understand what that deeper cause is and i think it a, a big part of it was something you put your finger on it in, in that the anthropos is not in the science um, and i don't think that's just in practice i think that's right now in principle uh, we have this scientific worldview in which we have no proper place or home we do not belong in it um, and i think um, i think when we say we're in, now we're in an existential crisis i think i want to invoke both meanings of that word in the, in the sense that our existence might disappear, but also in the sense in which, um, you know, Heidegger and Kierkegaard would use the word existential, that our, our fundamental self-understanding and our, our capacity for um, orienting towards trying to realize who and what we are and how we are connected to reality in a way that matters to us Socratically, like I was saying at the beginning, and not just in terms of a checklist of propositions that we have gathered together as true, but that really make the difference to people's life. And I think this translates down into, or translates out, I, don't, I, I wanna use the right metaphor, into a couple of very specific dimensions. One dimension is that to the degree to which people are impoverished, it, it, they lack that sense of uh, a self-transcending connectedness to themselves, to others in the world. Um, the degree to which they're in a scarcity mentality about that, they get locked into a kind, well, what all scarcity mentality does, it locks you into a kind of cognitive inflexibility, you get ossified, uh, you get very uh, self-protective. Um, so. Uh, that mindset, I, I think, is particularly deleterious, uh, not just for us existentially, which it is, but also in the other sense of existential, it actually significantly hampers our ability to bring wisdom to bear on the problems we're facing. So we, mm -hmm. we are lacking that way. There's a second dimension to that, which is, I think it's highly probable and plausible probable meaning there's you know evidence pointing towards it as having a, a significant chance of being the case and plausible in that it makes very good sense um that we are going to have to change and probably reduce our standard of living the way it's currently measured and understood uh, the way it confuses meaning with subjective well-being and subjective well-being with wealth uh, we're going to have to pull all of those apart. We're going to have to, right, change. And I think people will not take a hit to their subjective well-being unless you do something for them. And the evidence is dramatic, and you it comes out in the, the you know when people have a child, uh, because having a child, I, I use this example because it's so available to everybody. It crushes your subjective well-being. Your finances go down. Your health goes down. Your sleep goes down. Your foot, your feeding goes down. Your relationship to your significant other is significant. Everything goes down. Well, well why in the world would you do it? Well, because it's it's meaningful. Because people feel connected to something 
that has a reality and a value beyond mm-hmm. their own egocentric uh, framework. That's that connectedness to something bigger. So not only is the, that lack of meaning, that lack of proper participation, and I like that word very much, um, like sort of seriously hampering the cognitive flexibility and insight and discernment and self-direction we need to solve these problems, it's also demotivating because people will only take mm. a significant change to their subjective well-being, their contentedness, if you can actually promise them um, eudaimonia, if you can promise them an enriched meaning in their life. And, and so in these two mutually viciously reinforcing ways, the meaning crisis is particularly preventing us from doing what we need to do. And so I see it is in that sense, a meta problem that needs to be addressed along with all of our other methods and practices and attempts to address, as you put it, the symptoms. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot there. Um, so, I, I, and this is also, I think, why I get really excited when I listen to you talk with your cognitive science colleagues, because you're talking about reciprocal narrowing and Dang, reciprocal yeah. opening. And it's like, these things actually make a lot of sense to me. I don't, you know, I'm sure there might be some risk of confirmation bias in like, but, but something about what you're saying feels so right. And so like, actually that is what's going on. This whole idea of relevance realization that I'm scanning, looking for relationships, the ones to be in, you know, and, and creating a salience landscape and all of that. And then that, that gets embodied in some way, all of that makes perfect sense. Like, like not only, not only to me, like as like a, someone who experiences the world, but when I look at the story of the cosmos and I see how from the very beginning, from when it was a very simple universe, when there was not a lot of complexity, those dynamics of relation, relational dynamics, like they are written right into the blueprint that are in the DNA of the, of the cosmos, of nature, of nature. Reality. Yeah, I, I right. agree. I agree. I agree. Right. So, so that they would then later be expressed in cog- the cognitive infrastructure and the mechanics of human yep. thought and, and, you know, process it makes perfect sense. Like there's no, there's no controversy as to why our cognition, our inner dialogue, our way of making sense of the world would have this re- thing reflected in the actual fabric of the cosmos. Yes. And yeah. that, that, okay. is like, you know, I don't know if that's, if I, I know that that is a common experience throughout the ages that people have had an yes. insight into that, in that, yeah. that, 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 that the tacit knowing or the, the sort of, in, uh, the, the, um, the intuitive understanding of that, but it turns out it's actually borne out by the science, by the physics, by the, the, the ecological dynamics. So I, I, I think there's something powerful in there. There's something like, if we can recover that link to the cosmos, to nature, mm-hmm. then it, it would act as a kind of salve to you know, the things, these negative processing routines that, were, that, you, that, you, that you identify as us being stuck in. Yes. There's an opportunity there, it seems. I, I, um, I think that's right. I think that's right. I was recently talking with John Rustin about this, and uh, we brought up Ursula Gooden. I brought up Ursula Goodenough's idea about trying to get back a sense of transcendence, but not nostalgic, not to go back. No, right. Right, but to this idea of transcendence into the, in yeah. which the point of transcendence is to enhance the sense of the depth of participation that one is one uh, one finds oneself within. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I see that showing up in like the symbolic world, for example, I don't, I, I'm not here to like cr- criticize anything other than to say, like, if, if you seek that kind of meaning and that kind of connection in the world that we refer to now as the symbolic world, mm-hmm. then it will be as big as the symbolic world is. Yes. But if you can somehow find that sense of transcendence and that sense of deep fundamental belonging in something that actually is bigger than the, because the symbolic world is but a feature of the cosmos, right? So if you can then, and I see this, I see it playing out, you know, in, in, it's it's frustrating actually to, to hear learned 
thoughtful, sincere seekers, you know, yeah. going only so far as the humanities or the, yes, yes, you know, mythic structures that, 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 that arose in medieval times or, yes, yes. And, and then we seek everything within that. And then you've got this whole cosmos of nature that, that brought about that, that, that whole d dimension, that whole domain, yeah. but it somehow is like profane, you know, that, that it's. So this is, uh, I'm reading, uh, I'm reading, I forget the author of the book, Masters of Learned Ignorance, and I'm on, I'm reading um, Eregina, somebody who has had a huge influence and increasing influence. And I, I'm sorry, I forget the author of the, the book, uh, but um, the author is talking about how Eregina takes very, very, very deeply um, uh, 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 this sort of stereoscopic view. Uh, there's the scriptures, but there's also what he calls the book of nature and they're equivalent for him, books. Mm. And the idea there is- e Equivalent as like side by side like that or equivalent as in they are actually continuous in some way? They have, do they have continuity or are they just two different but, domains? Uh, so the- um, um, Clearly the second, and I'm, I'm trying to think of if there's an important difference that's picked up by the first point. I don't think so, but very, sorry, the mail was being delivered. Um, yeah, yeah, so for him, there's, uh, this is what the author is arguing. There, um, in fact, the, the point is um, you, there is a deep continuity between them such that you don't limit symbolism to human artifact. Um, and what you, you, you see all of, so you have to remember, he belongs to a platonic epistemology in which you are participating. Uh, you are in, you are, uh, uh, you are a, a fit, there's a, 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 a affinity between that you and that which you know in a profound way. And so within that, what he is arguing uh, uh, that Eregina argued for is that we see everything as we see both human symbol creation. Uh, now, for him, he wouldn't say it was human. He'd say that the scriptures were divinely origin, but I'll put that aside, right? He'd say that. I don't mean to put it aside dismissively. I'm just putting it aside so I can make a point, right? That that, that process, at least our response to the scriptures, which you could say is the symbolic world, and what we are coming into contact with reality, they both point to a deeper shared common source, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah. So for Eregina, that's what I mean by like stereoscopic. Um, I was trying to say like, you, 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 you look through the scriptures and I'll take that to stand for the symbolic world. And then you look through the cosmos, but remember this looking isn't, it's not Cartesian looking, it's, it's platonic looking. And you mm -hmm. look through them and you're trying to find God as the ultimate source for both of them. And so they have to be constantly read together. The two books have to be constantly read together. That was what was being proposed in Eregina. Okay, got it. Like, and, and, and all of that sounds, you know, doable to me. Like uh, yes. I, look, I, I look at it, you know, as a sort of, not linearly, but I do take time seriously, you know, in the way we understand it now, until some better understanding comes along, I'm going to look at this as a as a chronology, yeah. that that the universe happened 13.8 you know billion years ago. It started and complex relationships started happening, and the creativity of the universe is then expressed through those relationships, and that there is this continuum, a narrative continuum that brings forth life brings forth consciousness brings forth you know primates and primates do yeah. what they do and, and 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 maybe later we can get into you know how art fits into all this like like where does art actually really come from and um that these then this whole trajectory or this domain that you're sort of pointing at through one of the stereoscopic lenses then emerges from that. So in other yes. words, th they're actually not two bodies of knowledge. They're just one continuum of increasing complexity, which then comes into self-reflectiveness and then starts to create the symbolic world. But it's really, 
you know, it, it, it's, and then lo and behold, there's still God, you know, like it, 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 you don't, you do not have to forfeit God in any way, you know, not even semantically, you don't have to forfeit God in this. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So, so I, 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 well, let the, uh, and I, I share your aspirational hope. I do want to put in a note that uh, Erigena was driven away as a heretic uh, for proposing <laughs> that. Um, and, and we have to ask why that's the case, uh, because I'm, I, I'm sure that there are some Christians listening to that, to what I just said, and they're saying, of course, yes. But then I, 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 and, I and again, I'm not here. Why, why, why is that so heretical to say something as simple as the creation is the creator or the creator is the creation? I mean, it, I remember having a conversation like that with somebody who was really devout and it was just something that I could, he was just adamant, you know, and it was like, you know. So part of it is a historical answer. And uh, I'll try to be as respectfully fair as I can. Um, so Christianity is right, trying to capture the ancient world. And the main uh, competitor is uh, paganism, broadly construed. Yeah. Now, when we think of paganism, we think of some something from the Simpsons, like blood for ball and like really primitive, like, um, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a really, you know, a, a, a paganism that had gone through a lot of, of changes through in the hands of Epicur Platonism, Epicureanism, Stoicism, Neoplatonism. So it's a very powerful um, framework. Um, and so, so much so that Christianity adopted a lot of that into it. But Christianity yeah. also needed to powerfully distinguish itself from the pagan world. Yeah. Now, some of that was through the uh, really uh, prophetic, right, in the sense of telling forth of agape, that was powerful and was important. But also, Christianity made very made very clear that it saw itself as saying more clearly something that had been discovered within that philosophical tradition within Platonism, which was the distinction between immortality and eternity. So the gods are immortal, but they're not eternal. They do not reflect the ultimate principles of reality, right? Um, and the, and this and the, you can see this discovery in Plato where he, he he's pulling them apart, um, and so Christianity said, "Aha!" And what where we can see that very clearly is in the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, uh, which is the idea that unlike the gods, right, who emerge, right, and are immortal but are bound by a higher order, right, domain of eternity. This God, the God, the Abrahamic God, the claim is actually speaks from eternity and the, right, and is therefore not, um, not limited to the principles of the cosmos. And so, and we can challenge that. I'm just trying to offer an explanation, first of all. And so part of what is the fear is, is and it's not usually legitimate, and I think it was unfairly given to Erigena. I think it was unfairly given to Spinoza. There's a fear of pantheism, as it's typically called, which is all that we're talking about is we're talking about something that is emergent within the cosmos, but doesn't explain uh, the, the eternal dimensions. This was Plato's great concern too. So it's the Christians aren't just pointing in the dark. It's like, and I mean, and this is a this is a problem that goes still into the heart of the philosophy of science. Why should math, why should math tell us about the fundamental nature of reality? The think about what a weird thing math is, how abstract it is, how timeless and spaceless it is. And yet it tells us about how things unfold in time and space. This is an old problem. And um, I, and I'm not asking you to solve that problem. I'm, mm. I'm just trying to explain that Christianity saw itself as inheriting a criticism within paganism of paganism that it, it that it saw itself as properly aligning and fulfilling aligning to and fulfilling um sorry that i'm trying to make something very complex as short as i possibly can no i get it that there is this it is a morass of 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 inherited politics is what it, i mean i don't mean to say that you know in a disparaging way but that's kind of what it strikes me as is that there's a lot of jostling there's a lot of power dynamics 
there is good faith faith you know yep. trying to, to to feel you know that that deep and abiding sense of connectedness yes which i think is also part of it but at the same time it sounds like a lot especially given what we now know about the way the world has come to be, you know, prior to any of this arguing, prior to any of this yeah. conflict. I think, um, I think that's, I think that's right. So I'm reading um, Religion After Science by Selingbeck, who's in Nova Scotia, which is a province in Canada. So mm. whenever I can, Canada, yay. Go um, Canada. <laughs> and he's talking about um, that we have not yet, and this goes with what I was talking with Jordan about, and when talking with Layman and uh, and Bruce about Lehman Pascal, Bruce Alderman, you know, we haven't properly grieved the death of God. And, and, and part of mm. what I mean by that is we are aware <laughs> of big time, right? And this is Sellingbeck's point. We're aware of deep time, not only backwards, but forwards. And yet we have not taken it into our existential narrative. Uh, and, and he says, the most plausible conclusion we should draw about ourselves is that the ultimate questions are the ones that will take the most time and require the biggest time scale to understand. And we don't have those. So he, 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 he actually proposes, and I think, I mean, I want this to be taken care of. He proposes a hypothesis of spiritual immaturity, that it's very much the case that we are at the beginning of trying to mm -hmm. answer the ultimate questions, not the end, but at the beginning, and that we need to take an appropriate attitude towards ultimate reality that, that takes into account big time and engenders in us a profound acknowledgement and appreciation that we are extremely spiritually immature, rather than we have got the completed answer. And he says, like, like it, it's, it, it's, it's strange that we think that the most profound questions are the ones that have received the complete answer and less profound questions. Like you'll ask people, how long do you think it'll take us to really figure out something, some scientific phenomenon, they'll say hundreds, thousands of years. But the same people, if you ask, and he did this, right? If you ask them in another context, like what's the ultimate nature of reality? And they think, you know, well, we sort of have the answers for that. Mm, yeah, right. They either give us they either give a confidence theism or same thing, a confident atheism, and say, nope, the question's answered, it's solved. And it's but like, don't, but don't, 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 don't we see this as a fractal expressed in every teenager, in every? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, don't yeah. we though? I mean, I yeah, mean, yes, I mean yes, it's not yes. like it's it's not like it's hard to see. I mean, all the evidence suggests that we are in that sort of. And, and, and what it takes to mature is to be able to get outside of that a little bit and take, you know, accept a little humility about, about, you know, instead of pontificating about everything, just saying, well, we don't know. Like, imagine if you talk to somebody in the Bronze Age about religion, and could, could they have foreseen what was going to come in the actual revolution? They can't have, they couldn't have foreseen right. that. And, and, mm. and, and, right. And, 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 and then to, to this is this this is the end of illusion history. We 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 do it as individuals. This is how it comes, Rich, right into us. So if you ask people how much have you changed in the last ten years, they'll say, "Oh, I've tra changed tremendously." Mm. And then you say, "How much will you change in the next ten years?" Oh, I won't change very much at all. Mm. And you and they'll say this every ten years, by the way. Okay. So everybody well, believes they're complete, even though the evidence mm -hmm. is overwhelming mm -hmm. that they're not. I'm willing to cut people a break. You know, we're all children at this and yes. you know we're all sort of find ourselves cast into this thing and we're just all trying to figure it out so i'm not really i'm really not interested in you know i'm not saying you are either but just yes. not interested in sort of um complaining and um no no holding anyone to blame however we do we our backs are up against the wall and we do need something profoundly different some profoundly different way of relating to the world because we are on this terminal you know we're in and again, I know you've said this many times, I, I, and I say it over and over, I'm not a utopianist, and I'm yeah, not, yeah. you know, I'm, but I'm seeing how what the, the corner with that we've packed ourselves into here is now ecological. You know, it's no longer, it's not just some ideological thing that risks no, a no. lot of, you know, yeah. local suffering. Granted, we do now have, you know, mutually assured destruction 
looming. And so I'm not trying to dismiss that, but but once we do hopefully get beyond this sort of this this present medieval brutality that's surfaced, we can now focus on you know what is our what is the issue that is really putting all of us at stake everything the whole yes. history of us at stake which is ecological you know collapse it's it's runaway climate change of some form or another and or just the ecological um you know the local ecological collapses that are going to happen you know it, we've got to get this is why you know i'm sort of adamant about saying you know we have to do this in the framework of nature we've got to do this in alliance we've got to include the natural world as part of our future because if we don't get that one right, it really doesn't matter how you know how woke you are, if 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 you don't have a habitable planet. And and yeah. so, yeah. And I also have the good news here. I think also is that those 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 more socially confined problems will tend to resolve themselves if we get the deeper alignment, the deeper identification with the planet. I think that's right. I I, I do. I, I yes. I was not here to beat up on anybody. I was trying to answer your of question. Course. How we yes. got, how do we get into this sort of thing? And I, and I think um, I agree with you. We 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 need to bring back like uh, uh, Tillich. We need the God beyond God, the God of theism, uh, in this current situation. He was talking about that in the fifties, and he was talking just about the meaning crisis. Mm. And, but I think that's even more the case now, and that's something that Jordan Hall has been arguing for. We need the God beyond the God of theism, which is not. The God of pantheism, either, right? We 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 have to take seriously our spiritual immaturity and the spiritual ambiguity of the universe. We have to take those seriously, and we have to. Uh, we, 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 have to we have to embody them. We have to actually. Yes, we yes, need to, we, yes. We need to, we need to take 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 them on as our ours ours. Yes, as, as as how we participate. Exactly, and and we have to take them on not in a nihilistic fashion. Like, but uh, but uh, it, but it, in a way that opens the eyes of wonder, engagement, awe. Everything. Well, I guess it depends on what kind of future you want. If you want a nihilistic future, then take it on as a nihilistic pursuit. But if you want it to be a creative process, which it has been up until now for us, it's you know yeah. we have been on this extended creative role. Do we want to make choices that can further extend the creative role that we're on, or do we want to be the participants in the one that you know brings at least this experiment to an end? I mean. I don't see it's not a big hard question to answer you know do you want no, I agree with beauty you. and creativity or do you want do you want more ugliness to, I, I just don't think it's really even I don't even want to waste time asking the question you know like yeah I I, I mean I do I like first of all I agree with what you said but I do meet people that I don't know how to put it they've been exhausted they're burnt out to use Han's language. They've been burnt out <clears throat> by the nihilistic thread within the culture. And they okay, have... so let's. How about we're just tired of it? Well, if you're tired of it, yes. Try something else. Try yes. something else. Try identifying with something more fulfilling, something more gratifying, something more uh, beautiful. You know, and because it's there too. I, I don't think this is a question of sacrifice and compromise and a lowered quality of life. I actually think the opposite. That 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 the, that the secret of you know the, the the hidden gem here is that there's, there's something <laughs> profoundly more um, beautiful to be had in this process. I, I agree. I agree. It's everywhere. I I but let's take on this challenge together. and not posing it as something you're responsible for because it's something. But there's people that are beyond tired. There are people that despair. Uh, yeah. This is a Kierkegaardian point. And despair is a very self-fulfilling, self-maintaining mindset, right? Okay. It, it locks you in and it self-perpetuates and it defends itself against. And so part of the issue, and, and you know, and one of the things that's interesting about Kierkegaard on one side and Nishitani, Nishitani on the other is their answer is, well, in it, and I, I, I'm asking what you think of it. They say, well, you haven't followed the despair all the way down. That's Nietzsche's critique of, sorry, that's Nishitani's critique of Nietzsche. Like, you know, don't live it on the surface. Take it, take it all the way down. Like really open your, really take it on. Just hang on a sec. 
Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because you 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 you're responding in a very very I think um, predictable and responsible manner. What what they say is when you do that, if you are willing to follow it all the way through, it opens you out to something beyond all the frameworks that bound you into the despair, and you weren't aware of how they bound you into the despair. And I'm I. I so this is what, what I properly mean by we haven't grieved the death of God. Um, um, mm. and so Nietzsche's critique, right, was that we set the axial age gave us the two world mythology, and that was wonderful and beautiful and helped us talk about transcendence and the power of creativity and participation. But then what happens is this world progressively became instrumental for the upper world. The lower world becomes instrumental. And then when the upper world for historical scientific reasons becomes absurd to us, then we are only left with a mm. lower world that we have been enculturated to regard as purely instrumental in value. And so you say, well, don't, don't treat the world instrumental. Yeah, but you know what you need to do? You need to go back and unravel that axial age grammar, that two worlds mythology, that two worlds way of thinking of transcendence and participation, so that people can recover that. That's what I mean. Like, if we don't do that, we people are locked. They, like, you meet, I, I don't know if you meet people. I meet people say like, well, we're just meat machines. And it's like, well, you don't really live that way. But I understand what you, like, they, there's a whole, this is Nietzsche's idea of, right? And Heidegger picks it up, that we have a framework of seeing this world which I believe and you believe are the only world as only instrumental value. But if there's mm -hmm. nothing that it's instrumental for, then it has no value. This is what I mean about just, this is why Nietzsche proclaimed, the, the madman proclaims the death of God, not to the believers in the marketplace, but to the atheists. And he says to them, you haven't realized what you've done. You've taken a sponge and you've wiped away the sky. We are forever falling, right? That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, how do we, how, how, Sorry, I'm talking too much. You, 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 no, no, I just, I just, but I feel like, okay, well, we, we, we do have now, we have a new mythos that can actually restore right. that yeah. it's not down there and up there. What you're looking for up there is actually down there. It's act that's in the mud. It's the mat, the, the, the divine is this world. Right. And it is, and this is what the, this is what the science is telling us. Not that science is the only way of knowing. I'm not, you know, I'm not making an argument that science is the, the true and better way of knowing and that the indigenous and that the other spiritual traditions are useless. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that all of these things now agree that that immature way that you just described, that that yeah. that, that it, it, it's just mistaken. And and it's the problem I think though is that now it takes a lot of bandwidth to un to to deconstruct and uh, you know yeah. to de yeah. un, what is the word de de reify all yeah. of those things that and 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 bring in something install something that's bigger and and more complex and more r real more relevant to the, the world that we as we actually now know how it that that we live in so i don't see i see how it can be done it i don't think it's like hard in theory to do it's right. it's hard in practice because because we've backed ourselves into this corner yeah of 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 nihilism or complaint um so <laughs> we have it now like we do. i remember jim rutt asked you once you know what's the mythos and you know you were very sort of careful to answer his question by saying that you are not the prophet which yes. you know i i fully <laughs> you know can appreciate that sense that you know that take but 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 you didn't give him an answer about the mythos like mm. and 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 I guess what I would have, I would love for someone to ask me that question one day, not right now, but that, well, we do have a mythos. we have a mythos worthy of a new credo. You know, we have this. I, I agree. Um, so. And, oh, I, I guess yeah. for, for me, what you, and what you find exciting in the, in the 40 cogs eye is the point about the mythos, right? Is it has to be a mythos that engages your religio. It can't be, it can't be a story out there it has to be a story simultaneously out there and in here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right. It has to be transjective in an important way. And for me, um, and perhaps that's why you're finding the 40 cog side talk so exciting, is because 40 cognitive science is building a way of talking about biology and cognition 
that and its deep embeddedness and dependence on a dynamic environment, right, as a way that fits into a larger story, uh, a sort of meta modern story of complexity. So, I mean, uh, you know, Brendan uh, 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 Graham Dempsey did a great thing on the stove where he talks about, you know, you have uh, the traditional model, which is the classic two worlds, and then you have the sort of the optimism of modernity, and it it is offering right sort of this. Uh, it, it sort of emphasizes utility and power, and then you have postmodernism, which emphasizes diversity, and then the, the sort of defining ethos of metamodernism is complexity, um, and and the idea of um, understanding how important complexity is. So another way I would put it, it, is that not only do the traditional religions not really um, grapple well with deep time, both forward and back, the way Sellingback argues, Sellingback, Sellingback argues, but mm -hmm. they also don't, they're not set up to deal with dynamic complexity as a fundamental aspect of their ontology. And, and I think that is, uh, that, that's why there's this growing, and I, again, I'm not happy with this word, uh, but just sort of this metamodern spirituality, like, you know, it, 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 it's trying to be responsive and responsible to these deep facts. I'm going to use that really, you know, controversial term, but these deep facts about deep time in both directions and deep complexity, right? We need a spirituality that is mature, or at least trying to become mature, right? Uh, and, and, and here's where I turn to John Rusin again. He said, you know, never finished maturity. And let's take it that we are spiritually immature. But what does it mean to decide I'm going to become more spiritually mature? Yeah. It means to face up to fundamental facts of reality. And we need a religious vision. And this is why I'm talking to you that allows us to face up to the deep facts of deep time, both directions and deep complexity from the bottom yes. up and the top down, because the complexity goes both ways. Yes, and I'm, and I'm here to tell you that we do have that. When I listened to the Rusan uh, conversation, he talked a lot about maturing into you know the political and the economic realities that we inherit. Yes. But 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 what I didn't hear was a reference yes. to the natural ecological yes. realities that we are living into as well, because it's in those, it's in that story, the story of nature is that thing that you're looking for. We do have a really fine grained story of facts that when strung together in a meaningful way that 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 brings that continuity of what of my personal identity to the natural to the world to the cosmos we have that now like so it's and it will have it will extend its tendrils of impact into these other domains that we are just habitually drawing on like like jungian mythologies which i'm sure are you know amazing but they are human it's they are humanistic you know they are yes I, they I, are maybe maybe he was a cosmologist i don't know but but what we now know about the evolution of the cosmos is so much more fine-grained and getting more and more fine-grained every day into to eternity because that's you know, there, i'm not saying that there is a i'm not putting a boundary on what it is we can know because because now that if, if we can identify with the cosmos itself we don't know its trajectory it could be infinite yep. in which case yeah. So will our growth with it. So will our evolution into it. If we can yeah. get through this current bottleneck, yes. you know, which we are trying to do, I think. And there's, uh, so I, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't mean to like, but no, no, that I, was just so I, much I, here. Yeah. And uh, I mean, um, so, I mean, the talk with Jonathan, with John Rusin was amazing. John has had a huge impact on me uh, and his idea of trying to, I find so much convergence with my work of trying to bring Plato and phenomenology yeah. back together. Yeah. But you notice yeah. the one place where we were a little bit sort of, um, uh, not friction, but there was a little bit of distance was when I was pressing him on sort of uh, issues around transcendence and, and that aspect and, it more, uh, and, and, and uh, trying to take this more into an ontological depth, the way I see people like uh, B.C. Schindler and other people doing and saying, we, at some point we need to, right? And I, I think John would actually be open to this, what I've read. You know, we, we need 
and I'll use Eregina's language, we need we do need to reflect deeply on the logos of the Anthropos, uh, how, how, how logos shows up in human beings and in human being, but we also need to put that into relationship with the logos of ontology, uh, of the ontos, of being. So, right, those, and that, I thought, I see that as a, uh, as a properly platonic project. Uh, so there, people talk about the, 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 the two things that are being talked about in the Republic, there's the psyche and the state. Well, there's actually three that are being talked about in the Republic. There's the psyche and the state and the analogy between them, but the analogy between the psyche and the state and reality, there's the divided line and the cave. And so there's actually three that are in the platonic triangle, not just the two. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna talk to John again about that and, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up with him. But I did agree with what, what uh, he, he did agree with the, uh, the proposal of transcendence into as to as as different from transcendence beyond as part of what's needed and, and i don't know if you've read good enough but she she talks in a way very similar to to the way you do about I'm finding friend, i'm friends with, i'm friends with ursula well, of course you are <laughs> of course you are so i'm i'm sorry i i i'm speaking i'm i'm speaking to somebody who knows much better than i do but that notion of finding in the depths of nature a, a, a real transcendence that allows people to transcend out of egocentrism and leave the cave. Uh, if, if I, th I think that's very, very, very important. I think I wish that notion was uh, more broadly understood. I think that distinction is very important. And uh, of course, you know her. Um, so, it, it, you know, just I actually did interviewed pretty much every big historian that you know was, was around at the time when i was doing my research i went and spoke with every everybody i could find to to figure right. this out and hers her her you know her story and her her narrative her her trajectory is uh you know is a good one i think um yep. she had a religious background and found all that she found in religion she could also find in nature yes. and there was really no no controversy no no big conflict and it just opened it opened up it opened up her ideas of spirituality in a way that you know only nature can do. Um, yeah, and, you know, I, and, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. No, please. Well, I, I just like the sacred depths of nature, um, and, and I mean, you, you even I think it's Kuza who talks about this. You know, um, God is within but not enclosed. God is beyond but not excluded. Right? And if you think about, yeah, right. That's yeah, well, from, yeah, that's from nothing Nicholas inconsistent. Kuza. Right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Exactly. can exactly. I have? Can I have? Am I entitled to have that, even though I maintain a scientific worldview? Yes. I mean, or, or 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 would someone seek to deprive me of that? Yes. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not asking you. I'm just saying, like, how oh. come I can't have that 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 relationship to God too? Just because I just because I revere the creation, you know. Um, you can actually. It turns out. <laughs> I, I think so, a and. Um... I'm very interested in how the logos that shows up in Dialogos translates into relationship between uh, the human logos and the onto logos and how that should ramify into our relationship to uh, the world, uh, to nature. Um, and again, nature doesn't mean wilderness. Uh, that's part of the problem that people, that's also something that has to be Understood. The language is just the language fails us in that way, and that it's it's a constant struggle to, I you know I think you were telling me about Spinoza using yeah. nature or God in sort yes. of interchangeably. Yes, exactly, exactly. I wish we had I wish we had better language that could really capture the relationship that's inherent there. I think we need to read more Spinoza. Spinoza is in the midst of the scientific revolution. He 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 is maybe the mo one of the most profound first readers of Descartes. I think he's the person that translates Descartes initially. Um, so he gets what's going on. And yet he he sees the project is not going to go well if uh, if the spiritual, the ethical, the existential are left out of the equation. And so that's what he tries to do in the ethics. Um, he tries to correct that at the very beginning. And the, the, the language he used, and of course, he is also declared a heretic. He's, he's dismissed as a pantheist um, and, and a, a lot of things. And now what's happened recently, 
is he's been going through a revival and many people are saying these labels that you've applied to him are ways of actually misapprehending him as so he mm. can be dismissed rather than wrestling with the new way of thinking that he's trying to get you to see. Um, and I agree. So I, I strongly rep- recommend Carlyle's book, Spinoza's Religion. Mm-hmm. That book really, really uh, uh, opens up what Spinoza is doing in a way that is deeply relevant to what we're talking about here and now. Well, here's the thing, John. I, I think I might be living Spinoza's religion. This is the, I, I, I need to, you are. I, I actually, you are. I actually need to make a confession. You know, you, you, you're really great at rattling off, you know, researchers and books and things like that. And I have to confess, like, I don't, that is not where I'm coming from. I literally just, I come in off the trail. Like I was, you know, just on the yeah. Appalachian trail to come in and have this conversation. That's why I'm talking to you, but that's why I'm talking to you. And, and it's like, I, it just feels like, you know, someone has to, come in and speak for the earth. And I don't mean that in a, you know, I'm not saying that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way, I'm not saying that I speak for the earth. I'm saying somebody has to, somebody no, has to come okay. into this and, and speak directly for, because, and, and it's interesting that when I listen to your, you know, when your deep conversations with lots of people, I, I don't find myself referring back to something that someone has written. I refer back to something that I've either witnessed or experienced or yes. something yes. In, an, in the way an animal moves or just the way yeah. an animal carries itself, or the way that light bounces off of things or the way that the, the rivers meander, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this stuff out there in nature, which I think, I think there's something useful there to bring that perspective to this conversation i think there's it's more than useful i think it's necessary absolutely Uh, you said it last time you said something like you know you think that these these practice these ecology of practices that you know you're doing could benefit from you know having more sort of uh, time spent in nature contemplating nature actually i think it's more more than useful i think it's like be past due that nature be because it's through that relationship first with planet, then with cosmos, if you, if you dare to go. But the point is that we've got this planetary thing that needs to be healed. We've got a relationship with this planet that needs to be healed before we can make our way to the stars. You know, we're not going to get to the stars at the price of this planet. It's just not, we're going to get there by tapping into the creative impulse of nature. And until we sort of, drop the hubris and and do that you know in a serious way then the the universe is off limits you know to our the 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 galaxy doesn't need another parasitic species coming out and claiming colonial rights to the place you know it's like i think that um it's going to take a different um a different ideology of not an ideology but just a different mindset to to get there yes and And i agree totally with the way you are I mean, that where we, we've almost circled back to the first question, why am I talking to you? I'm talking to you precisely because, you, to use some of uh, Rusin's language, you, you bear witness to epiphany. That's what, the title of one of his books. You bear witness to epiphany. I cannot way, deny that. Yeah, <laughs> I cannot right. deny that. Right. And we need that. And that's the part of, you know, and, and, and Rusin's point, the brilliant point is um, that's, it's not only that we need it because of the, the, the exigent situation we're in, but we also need it because it's a fundamental need to bear witness mm-hmm. to, to epiphany. It's a fun, it's, I mean, I think I, bearing witness to epiphany, one of John Rusin's books is, is a masterpiece. I've read it twice. I've studied it with Dan Chappie in depth. And, and that proposal that bearing witness to epiphany is fundamental to us as human beings, right? I, that, that, that I think that's exactly right. So I want to talk to you because you're doing that. You're bearing witness to epiphany. I, I bring these things in not because I'm trying to point out or, or place a demand on you. I'm trying to, I'm just trying to bring in a convergence and, and say there, like there's as many, if we can bring as many voices together with, you know, different degrees of expertise and background and converge on saying the same thing, the more plausible and attractive it becomes as a proposal. That's what I'm yeah, trying yeah. to do. I, yeah, I agree. And I, I see that. I would say that um, I think it's actually beyond con- con- convergence and more 
in, in the realm of consilience. In other words, that yes. these are disparate lines of inquiry that are coming together on an insight. That insight then deserves some kind of privileged examination, a privileged analysis. It deserves... I, totally, totally. And it's, it's precisely because we're coming at it from disparate directions, whether that's spiritual or permaculture or, you know, any one of the other, you know, traditions it's 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 yeah and and i think nature is down there just kind of waiting to be to fulfill its role in this process we yeah. just have to take it seriously yes um i think nature's down there i think nature well uh, here i want to say something even different um i, okay. I, I hope it, i hope it lands well with you i want to replace nature's down there or up there with just oh, absolutely nature's absolutely. just around it, it, it's encompassing uh, right because it nature uses also, us yes, yes it's it's also yeah. beyond us in mm -hmm. like again the deep time and the deep complexity right and the combinatorial explosive nature of reality these are facts we can no longer deny in fact they are facts that we have to as you said we have to make central sacred to make centered to center it and to or center our attention to it we that's what we, we they have to become sacred facts to us um, they're very, they're, for many people, they're barely propositional facts. And for many people, they are not sacred facts, I would argue. Yeah, I think I, I, I couldn't agree more. And all I can do is to say again that everything that we know scientifically about the way the universe has unfolded, every new discovery, every bit of insight that science manages to you know, agree upon, it is a sort of a consensus operation but the point is that the best science we have is consistent and it it brings it it brings all of these questions together in a way that solves many many problems at once not all of them again this yeah. isn't about the end of inquiry or the end of suffering it's just that we're ready for this other way of imagining ourselves in the world yeah, and we haven't even had a chance to talk about all these things that I wanted to ask you about about your, you know, the, the, the some of the other papers that you're publishing and the, um, and and your conversations on predictive processing uh, with Mark. Right, that and, stuff yeah. is so relevant. It's so relevant. It's uh, and, and uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see the talk I gave at Cambridge about rationality. I, I, virtual. Oh, I did. I'm, I've been quoting it left and right about how, yeah. um, how uh, uh, augment imaginally augmented percept cognition and perception just to discern tr real patterns in the world is like that that is oika practice to me like that yes that's yeah. what i call oika practice i did want to ask you maybe if i could put you on the spot here a little bit yeah. the on the on the point about the nasa astronauts um sort of enacting a, a problem with the rover in their you know in their own biology are you saying that they that they experienced these faults or whatever you want to call it, these problems prior to learning that the Rover had this, had, 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 had an analogous issue or, or are you just saying that, I mean, cause what is the claim there? I mean, the scientist in me is asking this question saying, so I'm not clear about uh, which claim um, the claim that, they they would enact it, or the claim that they felt a sympathetic identity with the rover. Which well, the fact that they would feel a sympathetic identity isn't isn't really surprising to me at all. But the yeah. fact that they might feel it prior to it, prior to their knowledge of it. Uh, so uh, I think it's very. If I understand you correctly, uh, um, it 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 was not. It was something that uh, emerged intuitively, bottom up, and not even individually, but collectively, and only. I think when the ethnographers were there, was where they actually bringing any reflective awareness on this whole process. I they see. were okay. They were That's very a different claim. Yeah, yeah. That's they were very focused. They're very focused on producing the propositional scientific reports. As they should be. I mean, that, that's that's the, there's NASA scientists. I'm not criticizing them, but the the work of the ethnographers was to say, yeah, and that and that's what the work that Dan and I were doing in the publications, yeah. But doing that, this is a brilliant case study because of its strangeness, because of its displacement in time and space and topography, we can it can it can bring things out that are normally happening so fast and so implicitly and intuitively that we don't see them. And that the ethnographers go in and see 
right? And then Dan and I go and take the ethno. So you're, you're watching this process of recursive reflection that sure. is explicating. So by the time Dan and I get, and, by, and, then, and then I take that, by the way, Dan approved of it, right? He really thought the talk I gave at Cambridge was great. But then I took that and then develop it further. So you're getting, you're getting several orders of explication of something that was densely implicit in situ. Sure. No, that makes perfect sense. And that, that, that's a kind of, of a claim that I would say, well, yeah, you know, like that makes perfect sense. It's just that idea of that they would, that they would, that they would comp lodge a complaint about, you know, a, a stiff shoulder. Yeah. And then, and then two days later, you know, the engineers would, would report that, oh, by the way, the, it joints, was often the same day, the same day. They'd say, I was well, doing, you know, say, I was doing this in the garden in the morning and then I got, to the lab and spirits yeah. right wheel was stuck they would talk like, they would i don't have like i i would i would like, i don't have like an explanation like i obviously in terms of like if you i'll have to say to that if you say so you know like like that that's anecdotal I, 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 and, no, right. let's and, be very and, careful and, what i'm not claiming i'm not claiming clairvoyance or anything like that but what i'm claiming is they right are implicitly identifying with right. the rover in ways that facilitate them yep. uh, interacting with the rovers that they have which is profound which yeah, is let's, profound. let's not i don't want to you know dis, yep. dis, dismiss yep. that that's that is a profound description of of reality that actually is consistent with everything that i you know it, know about in act in activism uh so uh yeah i was just a little i just wanted clarification on that one thing about you know yeah, if no, the claim I'm is not, being made, that's all. Yeah, yeah. So some people have tried to say, oh, well, you're talking, you know, the clairvoyance. The, the, the thing that I would say, I, I'm not claiming that. Dan and I are not claiming that. Uh, well, I, 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 we're claiming what I just said to you. And one yeah. other thing. The one other thing is these scientists are having an experience that is powerful and um, functional for them, but they don't have mm -hmm. a language other than the language of magic to talk about it. And that's part of the meaning crisis. That's another. Yeah, kind. I totally agree. And and I don't think you need to call it magic. I think it's all magic. I mean, the fact that you and I are having this conversation, the fact that, you know, I'm here is magic. But the point is that I don't think you really need it's magical, but I don't think it's necessarily magic. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I agree. I agree. And I think trying I mean, so I want to be very careful. I'm not criticizing them. I'm trying to say they are struggling to find a language to articulate this. They do not have one. And so they resort to a kind of mythological way of explaining it. But they are trying to, that, that experience is pointing to a profound, a profound set of individual and shared cognitive processes uh, and, and, and ways in which, well, as I make the argument, the ways in which procedural, perspectival, and participatory knowing are doing the heavy work or making sense mm -hmm. so that the science is possible. Mm -hmm. I think that's the profound point, that sure. they're it's struggling, not... that their experience is sort of bringing into their awareness, but in a way that they can't bring a conceptual it's, it's like It's like, ta it's like tacit, no, I mean, it's, it's kind of yeah. Polanyi used tacit knowledge they're, they're in, not in, in a sophisticated is. way, yeah. yeah it is, yeah. it is, it's Polanyian through and through, very much, very, mm. very much. Very good. Well, I, you know, there's just so much, John, that I want to talk to you about. So, <clears throat> I mean, just like the, the function of art and like where yeah. art comes from and how well, let, that like- Let's do that next. Into, let's yeah. do that next let's do that in a, right. let's, let's have enough i mean <laughs> uh, let's let's do another one where we, we can come in and we can talk about the imaginal we can talk about art we can talk about ritual and, and follow up on everything we've talked about today so let's just set that up and make that happen perfect rich is there anything more you'd like to say before i stop recording no um not not not, not again i mean if i said it last time just that um I think that we are um, the the kind of things that are going on in the world right now make perfect sense given what we're going through collectively. You know yeah. that that, yeah. that 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 these events and this moment, this time is is pivotal, um, and it's 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 part of um, it's part of a much bigger trajectory of development. I don't mean to like make any profound claims on that other than just to say this is what transformation feels like this is what paradigm shift feels like and so try to enjoy the ride try to participate in it i guess that's it
Thank you so much, Rich. Thank you, John.